Hello health champions. Today I want to talk about the top 10 signs of iron deficiency. But more importantly, while that is a huge problem with iron deficiency, it is almost as important to understand if you have too much iron. So we don't want to jump to conclusions and we want to understand the whole picture. Coming right up. Hey, I'm Dr. Eckberg. I'm a holistic doctor and a former Olympic decathlete. And if you want to truly master health by understanding how the body really works, make sure you subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss anything. Iron is a trace mineral. We need very small amounts comparatively. And it's involved in metabolism. It's part of enzymes and protein that help us metabolize things. But the big thing that we're concerned with when it comes to iron is oxygen transport. That's what everyone talks about with iron is iron deficiency and anemia. Because iron is involved with making red blood cells and hemoglobin. Hemoglobin has iron in it and it only works if we have enough iron. Without that we can't make red blood cells. We can't transport oxygen. Hemoglobin is a large protein and it has four subunits. It's globular, it's large, that's where the name comes from, globin. And heme means that it has heme in it. So these green areas, they are the heme area. So there's four places, four subunits, where iron can attach. Here we're seeing one of those subunits and the arrow is pointing to where that iron would attach on the heme ring. Now something most people don't realize is that if we just take one atom and changes it, if we take iron out and replace it with magnesium, then the whole hemoglobin turns into chlorophyll, which is plant-based. So animals make hemoglobin, plants make chlorophyll, and they only differ by one atom per subunit. So what that means is, if you have a condition where you're anemic, but it's not because of a lack of iron, then you could actually benefit by taking chlorophyll because you would get the whole complex. You get all the components of the hemoglobin and you just have to pop one iron atom in there to make it happen. Maybe the most common sign of iron deficiency is fatigue. And when we're really low in iron, we can't make the proper components of the blood. So we get anemia or anemia, meaning literally lack of blood. The first thing we look at is hemoglobin. And we're supposed to have 14 to 15 grams of hemoglobin per deciliter when we brought the blood test. And what does hemoglobin do? It grabs oxygen, the blood comes to the lungs, it picks up oxygen, and the hemoglobin holds it and carries it out to the tissues. When we don't have enough oxygen, when we're suffering in our oxygen carrying capacity and can't deliver it, now energy production falls. We can't make enough of the body's energy currency called ATP, and as a result, we have fatigue. This is something we really want to check for in our office because if we try to get somebody healthy, whether it's for pain or metabolism or to heal something, the body has to have oxygen and energy to make that happen. So anemia is kind of a deal breaker. If it's supposed to be at 14 to 15 gram and it starts dropping down towards 10, now you have lost one third of your oxygen carrying capacity and a lot of your ability to produce energy. All around the world, this is the number one blood disorder. It's huge proportions. Globally, 25% of the world's population is anemic, 1.6 billion people. And in kids, it's even worse. So from children age zero to five, 47% of them are anemic. And in some areas like sub-Saharan Africa, it's as high as 70%. The numbers are gonna vary widely depending on the region, but just as an example, cause we are in the US here where I am, 
US adult men have about 2% anemia, whereas Caucasian females have about 10%. And why is that? Because females have a menstrual period. They lose a little bit of blood every month. It's a combination of nutritional status and how much blood you're losing. African American females and Latina females are twice as high though, and that's probably maybe some genetic component, but probably more so with nutritional status. When we look globally, it is very, very clear that the cause of anemia is primarily an iron deficiency. Very little doubt. However, in the United States, and especially for men, the picture is not so clear. So we don't want to jump to conclusions whenever we see anemia and think iron deficiency. Iron deficiency sign number two is pallor or paleness. Why is that? Because oxygenated or arterial blood is red, whereas once it drops off that oxygen in the tissues, the blood turns blue and that's why the venous blood, the returning blood is blue. So most of the veins that you see, most of the blood vessels you can observe on yourself are veins and that's why they're blue rather than red. Some of the places you're going to see this are in the face, your gums and lips, the lower eyelid. So if you just pull down a little bit on your eye, it's supposed to be a deep bright red. If it's not, then you could be anemic. The nail beds, when you look at the, the area under the nail, that's supposed to be a pink. If it's more whitish, that's another sign of anemia and iron deficiency. And the sclera, the white of the eye is supposed to be white. If it starts turning bluish, that means you have less oxygenation and a possible iron deficiency. Let's talk about the causes. Why might we be missing iron? Well, there's two simple reasons. One is that we're not getting enough, and that could be from diet. One contributing factor is veganism, because the best quality iron, the heme iron, comes from animals. And countries that are primarily vegan have much, much higher rates of anemia and iron deficiency. But even if we're getting enough through the diet, we have to be able to absorb it. And if our absorption is lacking in any way because of maybe not enough hydrochloric acid, maybe we have celiac disease, we have some inflammation, the gut lining isn't working properly, or we might have parasites. Any of those reasons and many, many others if they make our absorption suffer, we can't absorb it, then we're not getting enough. The other major cause, the principle of why we're not having enough iron is because we're losing too much. And this is actually a much more common reason than that we're not eating enough, especially in the United States. A very common way of losing a lot of blood quickly is through an internal bleeding called an ulcer. And an ulcer would be in the stomach, but we could also have holes and perforations at other places in our GI tract. A big reason is heavy periods. Women in their reproductive years have a menstrual period. And some women lose as little as a tablespoon and others lose as much as 80 milliliters or even a lot more. The average is somewhere around two to three tablespoons. And with that blood, you're also losing iron, and that is iron that has to be replenished through the diet, and you have to manufacture those extra red blood cells every month. Medications can also make you lose blood, and something as simple and common as aspirin for each aspirin, you're losing about five milliliters of blood, give or take. And there are other medications as well, like antibiotics and ACE inhibitors that can change the permeability of your gut lining. And then we want to think about what if we are taking some medication, but we already have an ulcer. Now we're really, really multiplying those effects and, and losing blood at a much faster rate. Sign number three of iron deficiency is shortness of breath. 
If you get winded very easily just because you're walking or you're walking up the stairs and this didn't used to happen last year, then you might be iron deficient. Why do you get easily winded? Because you have lost some oxygen carrying capacity. You can't make as much energy and now your body is making you breathe faster to compensate, to try to take in more air to make energy. So is anemia always an iron problem? No, it's the most common worldwide, but there are many other things like sickle cell anemia, when the blood cells are misshapen genetically and then they get destroyed and recycled at a much higher rate, then we can have anemia from that. You know, pernicious anemia, sideroblastic anemia, and there's hundreds of different types of anemia. A lot of them are genetic. And there's also anemia of chronic disease. This happens as people get older or they develop a chronic disease at a younger age. When the body stops working optimally, now we also get higher rates of anemia. And you would think that, especially in women, that when they get older, they don't have their periods anymore, they would kind of catch up. Well, oftentimes they develop something else, like a chronic disease instead, and something else isn't working as well. And in all or most of these cases, the iron is not the problem. It's that the cells are breaking down or we can't manufacture them fast enough, but the iron's not the issue. Sign number four is heart palpitations. That's when your heart starts beating harder or faster. You can feel it thumping in your chest. That's again because when we don't have the oxygen carrying capacity, we can't make energy and ATP. And now the heart is going to increase. It's going to beat faster and harder to try to compensate when the blood is less quality, when it's less concentrated resources, then we're gonna make up for it by sending more. Sign number five, cold hands and feet. And it's the same reason with the oxygen and the energy, but now it's because the body is prioritizing the vital organs. Your liver and your heart and your kidneys and your spleen and your digestion come first. You'll die real quick if they don't work. You can live with cold hands for a while. So your body is going to create some vasoconstriction and that pulls the blood toward the core and we prioritize those essential organs. Sign number six, dry, damaged, brittle hair. And that is the same mechanism. We don't have as much resources in the body and now we're going to prioritize the vital organs, so this is very, very similar to the cold hands and feet. Sign number seven is headaches, dizziness, and lightheadedness. And at first, this one looks like the previous two with lack of oxygen, energy, and ATP, but this one is quite different because the brain makes everything else work, so it gets the highest priority. It is 2% of the body weight, but it's 20% of the energy consumption. So it's an energy hog. It is using a lot of energy, but it's supremely important. So no matter what else happens, we're going to try to make sure the brain gets its resources. And now what we do then is we create vasodilation to the brain. We vasoconstrict to the periphery, but we vasodilate to the brain. And now what happens is as those blood vessels dilate, that's where the headache comes in. It's like a migraine. That migraines often have a throbbing quality where you can feel each heartbeat as a pain. And this would be very much the same way when we have a vasodilation headache. And that's because the body is just trying to get more nutrients there. Then what about the dizziness and lightheadedness? Well, because the brain is such an energy hog, it needs all that energy. It may not get enough energy even though we're vasodilating. And the brain, using all of that energy, all those metabolic processes, processing signals, then if we don't get enough energy, now the brain can't keep up with 
balance and processing impressions. Sign number eight is nail changes, something called coilonychia, which is spoon nails and very thin, brittle nails. So if you see this nail, it's kind of spoon shaped, very thin and it's flaring out. And that's a sign of long-term oxygen deprivation. This nail has not been getting oxygen or nutrients for quite some time. Again, both because resources are limited, but also because resources are prioritized to the vital organs, so we get vasoconstriction. Sign number nine is kind of crazy. It happens sometimes with anemia, with iron deficiency, but also sometimes in pregnancy. And it's called pica. And this is where we get cravings for things that have no nutrients, where we want to chew on something that can't give us anything, such as ice or clay or dirt. And another common one is paint chips. So if you notice that you start having cravings for these things, or if you notice your child is starting to chew on these, then that would be a good reason to start checking your iron levels. Sign number 10 is anxiety. And why does that happen? Because as we can't make enough energy, as our energy levels and ATP levels go down, now the frontal lobe starts to suffer. The brain, like we talked about, it's an energy hog. It uses a tremendous amount of energy. And it's sort of like a dimmer switch that if you have a light turned on and the dimmer is all the way up to 100, and then you turn it down to 60 or 70 percent, then the light will come down gradually. And that's kind of what happens with that frontal lobe as well. And the frontal lobe is critical for anxiety because it inhibits things like anxiety. It inhibits unwanted things. And if the overall activity of the brain goes down, then we lose some of that inhibition of the anxiety and now that anxiety is more uncontrolled. Take iron if you need it, but absolutely don't take it if you don't need it. So before you take it, you want to measure and make sure you want to measure a minimum of red blood cells, hemoglobin, the size, the hematocrit, serum iron, iron saturation, total iron binding capacity, and ferritin. If you are anemic and you need iron, then taking some of a good quality source could tremendously increase your health and your quality of life. But on the reverse of that, if you don't actually need iron and you take it, then it could set you up for a heap of trouble. If you enjoyed this video, you can continue learning about health and how the body really works by checking out that one. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you in the next video.